Uh, well, welcome to another one of Mr. Matt Paul's lessons on the British Empire. Today we're looking at the role of Christian missionaries between 1857 and 1890. And in particular, we're going to look into David Livingstone. So, as Punch said, the satirical magazine, upon his death in 1873, marble may crumble, but not this Livingstone. Okay, so he's indeed a man of interest. Now, okay, as you're making notes and going through, come on, it would be nice if this started working, for instance. Will this start working? Will this start working? Just the time for the computer to glitch, eh? Well, this is wonderful. I feel like a glitchy, glitchy computer. Right. Yeah. There we go. I'll tell you what. Let's just I'll get all the information on the side and I'll read through. Really annoying. Okay, I know there's a lot of information there. Don't we? Don't have to write it all down. You do have it on your computers, but yes, let's make your own notes. So, he was born in Lanarkshire in Scotland. Okay, and he was one of seven children. Okay, he was born into a very impoverished family. Um, however, at the age of 10, he had to help his family work in the local mill and raise some, fa raise some money for his family. But he used a portion of his income to buy a book on Latin and grammar. So he was a self-educated young man. And that is deeply impressive. And he, this, his life follows this rags to riches story, which deeply impresses itself upon the British public. And they find him an admirable man. So uh, in 1834, there was an appeal by British and American churches for, a qualified, for qualified medical missionaries uh, in China. And that's where Livingstone first saw himself going. OK, so I know that sounds pretty odd because he's so famous for his work in Africa. But the initial the initial object or region of his desire was China. Now, obviously, you would know that there were two opium wars fought there and it no longer became a place which was um, passable for British missionaries to go to because Britain was kind of deeply unpopular in the region, region for polluting an entire continent with heroin. OK, yes, the opium trade. So the opium trade and that first opium war in 1839 to 1842, which you know about, because even though it's before your course starts in 1857, the second open war is erupting. We have to put that in context. But the open wars put his dreams of going to China uh, to one side. But he has a meeting with this other missionary called Robert Moffat, who's a notable Scottish missionary in South Africa. And he convinces him that he should go to Africa. And indeed, he does. And Dr. David Livingstone is funded by uh, the London Missionary Society. And he goes to uh, South Africa in 1841. He spends 11 years there. 11 years. You know, he's a very intelligent man. He learns, uh, he learns a lot of uh, languages out there. He's even attacked by a lion, okay, and mauled. And he was quite hurt. And he could never again use his left arm properly, okay? Uh, to fire a gun, he could not use his left hand. He had to rest the rifle butt on his shoulder, okay? So he was seriously injured by a line, but that didn't stop him, okay? He was made of sterner stuff than that. So, in essence, he goes he goes around and he does a lot of travelling and he keeps a lot of notes of what he does. And um, he becomes the first European man, not the first man ever, but the first European man um, in on the continent of Africa uh, to sight Lake uh, Nagani, okay? And he writes this down in his diary and he sends it back home. And unbeknownst to him, when he returns home, when he returns home, he's been published. OK, so he returns home in 1857 and uh, his travels and researches sell 70,000 copies. It becomes a bit of an overnight sensation. He has a he has a meeting, an audience with the Queen Victoria, and he makes quite a lot of money from basically lecturing. OK, going from university to university, traveling up the you know, Britain, and giving insightful lectures about about Africa because of his ge rich geographical knowledge. So he's not just a Christian missionary. He's not just spreading the word of Christ, which is his for first and foremost faults. He's actually taking very accurate and detailed notes about the local geography. And this becomes one of his mainstays. Okay, This is what he combines. He combines his geographical exploration with his Christianity and with his attempt to open up commerce and everything he said he was doing was under, to underpin one cause. And that was his dedication to abolitionism. And we should know that abolition means abolition of the slave trade. Now, although 
Britain had outlawed the slave trade uh, in the 1830s completely, and that was a slow process. I've talked about a court case uh, in the late 1700s, and then there was the abolition of the slave trade, but not slavery, in 1807. And eventually, in the 1830s, it's, it's fully banned within the British Empire. Um, the Arab slave trade was still pretty prolific. Now, the reason that the Arab slave trade, one of the first and foremost reasons for that, was because of travel, okay? Um, merchants, rich Arab merchants, when they went to travel across Africa, especially for Hajis or anything like that, uh, they, they needed to transport their goods, and that's what slaves were principally used for. Okay, so he thought well, if he could get the British Empire to exercise more power on the continent of Africa and other European powers and to build infrastructure, then that'll put an end to the slave trade and that'll be all to the good. So this is something that was very close to his heart. So, yes, when um, Livingstone basically uses his, his fame to get more financial backing. So he's considered a national hero and uh, he gets a huge uh, financial backing for a new expedition. He's also awarded £5,000 sterling, which is an extremely large sum. Um, he, gets, he gets that from the government, and he has a new expedition in Africa, and we'll get to that on the next slide. This expedition in Africa kind of spoils the mythos of David Livingstone, okay? So, let's get this up here. All right, now, it's called the Zambezi Expedition, and it takes six years from 1858 to 1864. Now, another missionary who accompanied him, who we know as John Kirk, is extremely essential to our kind of understanding of Dr. David Livingstone. And why is this? Well, already I've told you before, because this is um, a kind of more revision lesson, really. I'm going to be honest, we're, we're revising what we've learned before. John Kirk has criticised his leadership um, potential and his leadership qualities, which were pretty much sorely lacking, to be honest. Now, the reason that these leadership abilities were lacking is because Dr. David Livingstone essentially had become a man of ego. And I know that's not quite popular to say about someone who's so loved in British history, but he genuinely believed that he had divine providence on his side. Now, let me explain what that means. It meant that he thought that God had essentially blessed and ordained him to do great things. And so every decision that he made on this Zambezi expedition was perfect, okay? And he should not be questioned. Now, can you imagine how arrogant this seemed to his fellow, his fellow missionaries, okay? Like he was making incorrect decisions. So, Doc, uh, sorry, uh, John, John Kirk, he's, he's not impressed. He's not, he's not impressed. And a lot of quarrels break out. So I think uh, John Kirk has, has a quote where he says he's out of his mind. He's just out of his mind in his decision-making, all right? I think this is important because it allows us to humanise Dr. Livingstone. And that's important. Now, moving on, um, this kind of fails, but then he doesn't open up the Zambezi River, which he hopes would end slavery. It's, it's kind of a bit, bit of a failure. But do you know what he does? He doesn't give up. This is something about Dr. Livingstone that's really interesting. He doesn't give up. Okay, And he goes for a quest for the Nile in 1866. Now, you and I know that the source of the Nile had already partially been found by John Hannon Speak. Okay, by Speak. Uh, but Speak... Um, his uh, his findings were doubted, especially because Richard Francis Burton had casted doubt upon them. So Dr. Livingstone was determined to find the source of the Nile. So he, he does this, but he does this by himself. And actually, it all goes wrong. Okay, he's the only European on this uh, expedition. And his goods are stolen. Okay, now his servants are supposed to be carrying his goods. They steal them and then they make up a lie and say, well, he's dead. So you get these rumours that circulate across the world that he's dead. Furthermore, he goes missing. He goes missing. So, and he was extremely ill. Now, one thing that he developed, and a lot of these uh, these missionaries and explorers developed, was malaria. Okay, now malaria is a terrible, terrible disease, and um, it, it can be it can reoccur as well. Okay, when your immune system is low, it can actually re like resurface, and it gives you really, really horrible. Um, kind of like fevers and fits. It's, it's really, really like quite horrible. He he was struggling with this. Let's not forget, he's also struggling with a shoulder injury to a lion, which he's been mauled by a lion all this time. So he truly went through the wars. Now he goes missing, and um, search parties went looking for him. We know this famous story. Okay, all right. We got um, we got Henry Morton Stanley from the New York Herald, sent by uh, Gordon Bennett, and he finds him. 
And the thing is that, that Livingstone is a Scot, and they say that Scots are dour Scots, a dour, dour. Okay, and therefore they're not overly tactile. They don't like to be touched, so you shouldn't hug them or shake hands. But obviously, um, Henry Morton Stanley was delighted to see him. He's been looking for him <laughs> for a long time and sh like traveling for Africa. So he would have been delighted when he saw him. And obviously, he removes his hat and approaches him. And Dr. Livingstone, I presume, okay, from famous, famous lines throughout history. Okay, now, um, Morton Stanley, he's like, come on, come back, come back to, to Britain. Well, let's, let's go back together and, you know, we can say what we found and everything. He does. He can't convince Livingstone to go back. Okay, Livingstone has got a mission and he's just got to do it. So Livingstone moves himself again, obsessed by his uh, quest for the Nile, but and to destroy the slave trade. But he is ill and he dies from dysentery. And most famously, he dies at prayer, which is very befitting a Christian missionary. Now, obviously, he's famous for only ever making one recorded conversion. So he may have not have been that successful as a missionary, which is, you think was his primary objective, but he did do some great things. And one of them was to bring um, some greater focus on the Arab slave trade, which the British Empire actually did quite a bit to hinder and stop in certain places, especially Zanzibar. Okay, uh, within the Britain, within the British government across Africa, and there was a lot of pressure put on countries to to stop this slave trade. So ultimately, he's a man that did a lot of good. And when we in an era where we see statues falling down of like like maybe less moral characters like Cecil Rhodes, you his his legacy is still kind of enshrined. There is one negative we can see upon this, and that is that there's a kind of cultural arrogance to the evangelization evangelization of religion. But he still seemed to be quite a moral character, and he's still quite revered in lots of in lots of uh, parts of Africa where he made uh, an influence. Okay, now his heart was removed and buried in Africa. Now you might think this was done for emotive reasons. The reason that was doing was to preserve the body. And he was taken to Westminster Abbey, and he was buried there. And his funeral provoked public mourning like that you wouldn't have seen in your lifetime. The only thing I've, I've seen comparable would be the death of uh, Princess Diana here, when, as I said. Adult men and women lined the roads of London and cried a lot of tears. Okay, but his death provoked a very similar, if not more, wave of uh, of, of public mourning. So, Dr. David Livingstone, quite an interesting life there. I hope you appreciated that mini lecture. Da, 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 da. Let's turn this off now. Boink and boink.